and fauna. Tonight on Catalyst, I'll be travelling across Australia to see how emerging technology is being used to safeguard our wildlife. As wildlife smuggling evolves, this technology is also evolving with it. We're attempting to restore these amazing underwater forests. Genetic gold. There's a revolution taking place, allowing us to intervene before it's too late. Wildlife Revolution, tonight on ABC and streaming on iView. From the ashes, a hero returns. He shares no glory, wears no cape, and takes no prisoners. Kids, don't try that at home, but that sounds awesome. Now, Tom Gleason is back. He's not the hero we wanted, but the hero we needed. Hard Quiz returns August 18 on ABC TV and streaming on iView. We got our first power bill. There was minimal saving, if anything, so we basically just thought we'd been gypped. The pitfalls of rooftop solar. It affects my health now. I get upset over it. When things went wrong, it was too hard to get it fixed. There was not a one-stop shop for me to go to and get the whole issue resolved. Where households can turn if it goes wrong. It's not an easy thing to research. As a consumer, you just feel like you're an annoyance. 7.30, tonight, ABC TV. Or stream it on iview. New modelling shows young adults are the peak spreaders of COVID and should be made the priority for vaccination. A strategy that draws on the direct protection that's already been achieved but amplifies it by focusing now on transmission. Queensland's Delta outbreak grows by 16 with a case detected in the state's far north. The Chief Executive and Chair of Crown Melbourne To Go has the casino acknowledges its failings before a Royal Commission. And smooth sailing in Tokyo, Matt Belcher and Will Ryan on the cusp of another gold medal. Hello, welcome to ABC News, I'm Karina Cavallo. New modelling released by the federal government has found young adults are considered the peak spreaders of COVID-19 and they should now be the priority in the vaccine rollout. Political reporter Matthew Doran has more from Canberra. This modelling from the Doherty Institute is being used by the federal government and also state and territory governments to plot a path out of the pandemic. And while it's saying that the vaccine rollout so far has been on the money in terms of uh, who it has prioritised, so elderly Australians, Australians with underlying health conditions, frontline health workers, where the greatest risk from COVID-19 has been, it's now suggesting that it should be starting to shift to younger Australians who are more likely likely to be uh, uh, spreading coronavirus if indeed they are infected, spreading that through the community because they are genuine, generally more mobile and uh, are more likely to be in a position where they are spreading that virus around. This modelling is being used to look at what easing restrictions will mean for the coronavirus infections across the country. We know that National Cabinet late last week on Friday evening, in fact, decided that that the nation would have to get to a rate of 70% fully vaccinated, that is two doses of a coronavirus vaccine, 70% of the eligible population to have that full vaccination before there would be a move into the next stage of easing restrictions, where lockdowns won't be as common, where there could be a situation where vaccinated Australians don't find themselves uh, having to adhere to the strict or strictest coronavirus uh, regulations that are put in place to deal with outbreaks and then 80% for Australia to move into the next phase of reopening where lockdowns would almost become non-existent other than in extremely targeted and uh, special circumstances. But when we're looking at uh, this modelling, it is worth pointing out that it is suggesting that there would be thousands of cases in the Australian community if we get to that benchmark and then uh, pull away all of the social restrictions at once. So you'd sort of mitigate and manage that situation 
situation by potentially not looking at lockdowns, but still adhering to things such as venue capacity limits in pubs or restaurants and uh, things like uh, p potentially the ongoing use of masks in that situation. Uh, pr to Professor Jodie McVernon from the Doherty Institute was very keen to point out that she believes the initial rollout of the vaccine, the priority uh, areas were appropriate and said that it is a, it follows and mirrors what many other countries around the world were doing. But she is suggesting that now that should start to pivot towards younger Australians to make sure that they too are uh, fully vaccinated and fully protected from COVID-19 as that reopening continues. We, with all other populations and considering the ethics and all other things, started by directly protecting those at most risk of severe outcomes and the gradient um, of severity varies so substantially by age and the risks of death vary by age. All developed populations have focused on risk reduction first. Where we are now off the base of what has been achieved with the program, um, looking at the best strategic use in moving forward, uh, our recommendation is to pursue a strategy that draws on the direct protection that's already been achieved but amplifies it by focusing now on transmission. So if that baseline hadn't been there, we would have had to have an intermediate strategy, I suspect, um, to be able to take account of that group. Matthew, what's been the reaction to Labor's proposal of financial incentives for people getting vaccinated? Well, the federal government has dismissed it outright with some senior members of the coalition describing it as an insult to the Australian population, saying that most Australians want to do the right thing, they do want to get vaccinated, and to suggest that they need a financial incentive to do so is an affront to their sense of community. This is a proposal that was put forward by the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, for $300 cash payments to everyone who gets their two doses of a coronavirus virus vaccine in a bid to try to speed up the vaccine rollout and incentivise those who might be on the cusp, or might be wavering, reluctant to get that vaccine, encouraging them to do so. Uh, the federal opposition says that this is a uh, small change. If, if every Australian was getting their vaccine, this would cost $6 billion, but that is small change compared to how much every lockdown that is imposed on major cities like Sydney is costing the Australian economy. But the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, wasn't having a bar of it. In question time today, he said that this was an affront to uh, Australians looking to do the right thing and took aim at Albanese, Mr Albanese. The Leader of the Opposition is treating this like a game show, Mr Speaker. And he needs to ensure that when he puts policies together, they won't be ill-disciplined or ill-informed, Mr Speaker. He should take the opportunity to ensure that he is across this information, as he should across all his policies, because what it is showing with this Leader of the Opposition is, Mr Speaker, they have learnt nothing, absolutely nothing, Mr Speaker, over their years in opposition. That's the Prime Minister speaking in question time earlier today. Anthony Albanese hit back, saying that this was uh, simply a situation where the Prime Minister was trying to cover up his own failings in managing the vaccine rollout. He pointed to comments from the Chief Medical Officer, Paul Kelly, saying that there could be room to look at incentives into the future to try to get those uh, reluctant or hesitant Australians to roll up their sleeves. And he says that Scott Morrison is simply trying to cover up for the failings that he uh, he's presided over with the vaccine rollout so far. Prime Minister has been as slow as a wet week when it comes to actually delivering. He said, he said repeatedly that it wasn't a race. It's not a competition. And again today, he thinks people are goldfish. He's apparently unaware that when you say things in Parliament and, and at press conferences, it's recorded. That's the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, in the House of Representatives a short time ago. Karina, we are a fair way off reaching that 70% full vaccination target across the country. The current figures show that the national average at the moment of people who have had their two doses is sitting at just 19.7%. With that target of 80% of the population fully vaccinated now set by the federal government, here's where we stand at the moment. Across eligible people 16 years of age and over, more than 41% have had at least one dose. Almost 20% of the population has been fully vaccinated. That's a total of 12.5 million doses rolled out so far. Today, more than 200,000 vaccinations were administered. 
Professor Emma McBride is a mathematical modeler at James Cook University. She's told Patricia Carvellis on Afternoon Briefing the government should be targeting the transmitters in the community. Now that we've got really good coverage in the older age groups, particularly the over 70s, and everyone in that group has had an opportunity to be vaccinated, the next most important group are the transmitters, and that's the, the youngsters, the late teens, up until about 30, 35. They're the next priority group, um, and they're the group that really fires the, the ideal uh, vaccine for because it reduces symptomatic infection, reduces transmission. So they should certainly be offered Pfizer, and we should be opening up the age groups across the nation for those, uh, for those doses, yeah. Yeah, you just made the point they should be offered Pfizer. But obviously, the supply of Pfizer is the problem and, and why that's not mm. possible. So mm. in that context and the fact that they are seen as the spreaders that need targeting, does a target's advice on who should get the AstraZeneca vaccine need to change? I mean, it's changed in, in for Greater Sydney. Should it change for the rest of the country too, given what this modelling shows? I wouldn't say given what the modelling shows, I think given all the evidence uh, that we've seen to date. Uh, yes, everyone... Uh, so, first of all... Um, ideally, we would give AstraZeneca to older age groups and Pfizer to younger age groups, but we don't have enough Pfizer. So if you're in a younger age group, uh, I would suggest wherever you are in Australia, get whatever vaccine you can. Uh, but if we were being strategic, ideally, we would be giving AstraZeneca to the people in their 50s and Pfizer to the people under 50, and that's exactly the opposite of what we're doing at the moment. OK. So... Do you think there's a sense of urgency about changing that strategy? Well, I think Atagi's made it very clear that in the midst of an outbreak, you should seriously think about getting AstraZeneca or whatever vaccine you can. Uh, but I think they've been a little loose on the definition of what's urgent and what's not. I would say anyone in Australia should seriously consider, if you haven't been vaccinated, getting whatever vaccine you're, you're offered at the time, uh, regardless of where you are, because... The Delta virus is not going to just sit around in Sydney for the next month or two. It's it's going to spread. So I, I think we, we all need to rethink our personal strategies and our national strategies, yes. Do you think young people have been neglected in the vaccine rollout? You mentioned that you've been agitating for this group to be prioritised. Have we been too mm. slow to, to, to come to this? <laughs> Well, it was very sensible with limited supply of vaccine to target the over 70s to start with. That was absolutely crucial. I, I have no problems with that. And my modelling and, and the Doherty modelling uh, and every other modelling group has really said that. Uh, they're, the, they're the important group. It's so age-specific, this, this severity of disease, that we have to target them. Uh, but then once they got out of the way, I think, to just step down through the age groups to target the 50s and the 40s and the 30s, that's, that's, not, that's not the most effective strategy. So, yes, I, I, of course, I think we've been too slow. We've been too slow to start the conversation about how low do we go in terms of age groups. I think we should be vaccinating under 16s, and this is where my work and the Doherty's work sort of diverges. Uh, they make some assumptions about how infectious this Delta strain is. They assume that it's our effective is 3.6, which is fairly uh, optimistic, I would say. Whereas I have looked at if it's three, if it's five, if it's seven, what are the differences? And if it's as infectious as having a reproduction number of five, then we must vaccinate teenagers or we're not going to get to herd immunity. Now, maybe we don't want to get to herd immunity, but if we don't vaccinate teenagers or at least 12 years and up, we're going to have a reservoir of infection that's just going to grumble away for a very long time. So, obviously, the, the vaccine has been approved for, for those who are 12 and up. Do you think that should mm. be a priority group in terms of vaccinating that group as well in the, in the shorter term rather than waiting till the end of the year or next year? Well, I, th I think the immediate priority is the 18 to 30-year-olds. They are just spreading <laughs> spreading Delta like crazy. And, um, you know, they're social and that's what they do. Um, so you've seen the list of all the different places they've been around Sydney and around Brisbane. And, you know, they, they get out and, and spread virus. That's, you know, that's, that's the age group. So I think they're the highest priority. Emma McBride speaking to Patricia Carvelis. The cluster in Brisbane's west has grown to 47 with 16 new locally acquired cases and a case has been found in the state's far north. Emily Gromens has more from Brisbane. 
Nine of these 16 new cases are school students and between them they're linked to four different schools. Indrapilly State High School, Ironside State School, a primary school in Brisbane's West and Brisbane Grammar and Brisbane Girls Grammar. Now five of the other cases are household or close contacts of existing cases in this cluster and another one is a neighbour um, which is interesting. The, um, the health authorities today said this is a perfect example of why um, keeping your distance from people is so important at the moment. We obviously don't know the circumstances of how this neighbour caught the virus, but they're saying, you know, with thousands of people in home quarantine, of course, many people want to help their neighbours, but call your neighbours if they, if you have their number, don't go around to their house to offer assistance. Now, there are 35,000 tests were done overnight, um, or nearly 35,000 tests, which is a pretty high number, and, and authorities want to see that testing rate stay. Day, um, you know, right up there. We are in lockdown here in southeast Queensland until four o'clock on Sunday, but there's a number of factors the Chief Health Officer will look at when it comes uh, to lifting that lockdown at that time on Sunday. Uh, she stepped us through earlier today what sort of factors she'll be considering when it comes time to either lift the lockdown or see it extended. On Sunday, I want, will want to have seen that any new cases that have been coming up have been in quarantine for their full infectious period. Some of them have been out infectious in the community for up to six days. It's too early in the outbreak to expect that all of these people will have been in quarantine. Emily, what's the latest on the case in Cairns? Yes, this is a late uh, development today. Karina, my colleagues in far north Queensland, were able to confirm this case around midday today. Uh, it wasn't part of the 16 figure that we had earlier in the day. Now, not much is known about this case at this stage, but uh, we have spoken to a local MP up in Cairns uh, who says this is a person who's returned from Brisbane to Cairns' northern beaches area. Uh, they were fully vaccinated, and the testing shows that their infection level is quite low so there are there is some retesting happening to try and confirm if that case is active or if it's perhaps an historical infection but it really speaks to the message that authorities here in Queensland have been trying to hammer home for a long time and it's never really been more relevant than at the moment we have the Delta strain in the community that anyone anywhere in Queensland needs to come forward for testing at the first sign of even a mild symptom and they're really continuing to push that message to people across the state today. Emily Grimmens reporting. New South Wales has recorded 199 new cases of COVID-19. At least 82 of those had been in the community while infectious. Cecilia Connell has more from Bankstown in Sydney Southwest. Of the 199 new cases recorded today, Karina, concerningly 50 of those were in the community for their entire infectious period. A further 32 were in the community for part of that period and the isolation status of 47 cases remains under investigation. Of today's 199 new cases, the source of infection for 111 of those, so just over half, still remains under investigation. The new cases today brings the total number of cases since the Delta outbreak began in Sydney in June to 3,832. At the moment, there's 250 people in hospital. Of these, 53 are in the intensive care unit and 20 require ventilation. Of the 53 people being treated in ICU, it's understood that 43 are unvaccinated. In the last 24 hours, there were more than 100,000 tests conducted, which health authorities say is positive to hear that that, that number, that testing number, is staying at around the 100,000 mark each day. So they're urging people to continue to come forward for testing, particularly in the western and southwestern areas of Sydney, which health authorities today said the concentration of cases is really in these, these areas again today. The New South Wales Chief Medical Officer, Dr Kerry Chand, said she's still concerned about transmission in households and in workplaces. She's urging people not to visit these eight LGAs of concern unless they absolutely have to. Here's a little of what she had to say today. 
the disease is actually um, got the potential to creep. And so we also are asking that you don't go into those suburbs, um, even if they're within that um, permitted radius, to shop, um, go to a different shopping, shopping centre. At this point, we want to minimise any risk of um, further spread of the virus to, to other areas. The New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian also today announced a vaccination target. She'd like to see six million doses administered by the end of August. At the moment, there's been 3.9 million doses administered, administered in New South Wales. Now, if the state was to get to that six million dose benchmark, it would mean that around half of New South Wales adult population would have uh, received a dose of a vaccine. Now, now, the Premier said that this would provide further options as to what life in Sydney and the rest of New South Wales might look like beyond the end of August when the lockdown is at this stage uh, expected to end. I don't want to raise expectations because we have a lot of hard work to do between now and the 28th of August. We need to really see those case numbers come down and I'm really keen to us to get to those six million jabs by the end of August as well. Uh, on the current rate that we're doing, we should be able to get there with the jabs, but it's also important, as our health experts tell us, uh, to make sure we concentrate those vaccination rates in those eight local government areas of concern because that will slow down the spread, it will reduce the case numbers. Cecilia, some of today's cases are linked to a Sydney nursing home. That's right, Karina. So six of today's 199 cases are connected to the Wyoming Aged Care Facility at Summerhill, which is run by Hardy Aged Care. Now, it emerged over the weekend that a student nurse at that facility had tested positive and worked at the facility while infectious. However, they were unsymptomatic and weren't aware that they were infected at that time. So today, six cases have been connected to that facility five residents and an additional staff member. It brings the total number of cases connected to that cluster to 20. Also today we heard that a staff member at Sydney's Westmead Hospital has tested positive. It's understood that that staff member was fully vaccinated and acquired the infection in the community. They worked for three days while infectious and as a result, 36 other staff are now in isolation being deemed close contacts of that staff member. The hospital says that all areas within the hospital have been deep cleaned and that patient care is the first priority. They say that there's no evidence of any further trains of transmission uh, linked to that case at this stage. Crown Resorts has confirmed Xavier Walsh will cease his role as chief executive of its Melbourne casino later this month. The announcement came just before the Victorian Royal Commission resumed hearing submissions, including from Crown Resorts and Crown Melbourne. Xavier Walsh has worked for Crown Casino since 2008. An interim CEO will be announced after consultation with Victorian government authorities. Well, staying with this story, I'm joined now by Ian Dunn, the former chair of the Victorian Commission for Gambling Addiction. Ian Dunn, thank you so much for your time. Some big departures from Crown in Melbourne today with the Chief Executive Xavier Walsh going and Chairman Helen Coonan is set to announce she's leaving before the end of this month. What's your response to that? I must first of all correct you with regulation, gambling regulation, not, not addiction. But uh, um, yeah, they are big changes. I have very little to say about that. I'm not not involved uh, with Crown in any way, and I, I've kept only a, a passing in, uh, interest in it in the last few months. But uh, I felt that the changes which first occurred after Patricia Bergen's inquiry were inevitable, and I suspect that today's changes are inevitable also. The Royal Commission Commissioner flagged the possibility of another company taking over Crown. Would that be a solution? Well, yes. Some have thought that if the government acted... If the Royal Commissioner recommended that the licence be cancelled, some have commented that that would mean that the casino would be closed. Now, as Ray Finkelstein said today, that's not the case. There would be plenty of other appropriate authorities perfectly happy to run the run the, a very profitable casino 
So um, I don't think that it, you know the, the walls are not going to fall fall in if uh, if the if the government were act, to act on his recommendation if that's what he recommends. Yeah, Crown's lawyers um, opposed that because there is a question over the future of the ten thousand people that Crown employs in Melbourne if that were to be the outcome. If, if you going to run a casino, you'll need employees. and Someone's going to have to run that casino. I can't imagine that the casino is not going to be operating. Look, whether we like it or not, in the early part of the, this 21st century, the Victorian people voted for a casino and they voted for poker machines. A lot of us would <laughs> wish they hadn't voted for either. But that's what's happened. Um, the casino exists and I'm sure it will continue to exist no matter who it, who it is that's running it. There'll be a new regulator in Victoria to focus solely on casino management. What difference will that make? I'm not quite certain it's going to be as far as that, but the, the big difference is that the change which was made in 2012, which incidentally was just after I left the Commission, the change whereby they integrated uh, gambling regulation and liquor regulation, that's being set aside and that's a good thing. It was a mistake to do it at the time. Um, and I think it's denuded the Commission with good resources for gambling regulation. Now, there'll be a specialist um, casino regulator within the new body. That, I think, is also a good thing. Uh, I think the changes today are uh, welcome um, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing the outcome of them. Yeah, can you speculate as to what the outcome might be? Is it just a, just well, a greater focus? Well, yeah, you, there, look, People don't understand this. Casino, um, gambling regulation is awfully difficult. Um, you're dealing with big money, big people represented by the best lawyers and so on. You, you need to have high quality people doing it. Now, what I've been able to discern in the last few months is that it seems as though the resources available to the existing regulator in Victoria have been reduced over the years. And that's unfortunate. But I just want to say very quickly that the regulator in, in Victoria, I've just looked at these figures, we have about 60% gaming expenditure compared with New South Wales. That's pro rata, that's per person. Poker machine expenditure in Victoria is way down compared with New South Wales and it's well below the national average. Now that's in large part due to the efforts of the, of the present regulator because it has to grant or not grant applications for new poker machine licences and it has regularly knocked them back in problematic circumstances and for that we should be very grateful. So it's not just the Royal Commission taking place in Melbourne. There is a Royal Commission in WA into Crown. While you mentioned the Bergen inquiry, so in New South Wales, that inquiry found that Crown was unfit to operate its Sydney casino. Um, what more can be done to clean up the company? Or do you think that's, that's the end of Crown? No, no, I don't think... Uh, well, I'm not certain it will, will be. Um, it's possible that they'll get a continuation of their licence in Victoria under strict terms and conditions. That's a possibility. I must say I don't understand how the New South Wales regulator could now grant a licence for Barangaroo until Mr Finkelstein has reported. And I think that the, the Western Australian regulator will be looking at, at both Bergen and Finkelstein all the evidence that's come out. I mean, some of the evidence, I have to say, has been frightful. And uh, no wonder people are shocked by it. Ian Dunn, the former chair of the Victorian Commission for Gambling Regulation. My apologies for getting that wrong. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Fine, Karina. OK. The Reserve Bank has kept the cash rate at the record low of 0.1% as expected. The RBA has also maintained its decision to buy government bonds worth $4 billion a week from September, down from $5 billion a week. Economists had expected the RBA to reverse its decision to wind back stimulus measures in light of the ongoing lockdowns in Sydney and other parts of Australia. 
More than 100 Olympians, including new swimming golden girl Ariane Titmus, have entered quarantine near Darwin after jetting in from the Tokyo Olympics. They've been flown home on a special charter flight together with team officials. Reporter Melissa McKay has more from Darwin International Airport. Well, about 115 athletes and staff touched down here in Darwin just after five o'clock this morning before they were ferried through the terminal uh, to sort out all of the biosecurity issues uh, and then ferried onto buses to head out to Howard Springs where they'll spend the next 14 days in quarantine. Now, there has been uh, a lot of talk about the mental and physical health of these athletes over the next two weeks as they go from the absolute highs of, of being in the athletes' village and competition stadiums in Tokyo into isolation for 14 days. So they've all been given a little welcome package which includes some treats and a timetable of digital and physical activities that have been planned for them over the next 14 days. I'm told the athletes will be kept together uh, in the facility. They'll all each have their own little room with a balcony so they will get some fresh air uh, but they will hopefully be able to see their teammates from across the footpath or on the uh, opposite balcony uh, so that will hopefully be able to uh, give them some peace of mind uh, and we can also expect to see another plane load of athletes and staff touching down next Monday uh, before they go into Howard Springs for the next 14 days. Time for a check of the weather now here's Lara Himes. The troughs that are moving through the southeast, they are triggering some showers and also some storms, but they will be heaviest in the northeast of New South Wales. We'll also see some falls through the alpine regions of Victoria and also the snowies of New South Wales, snow falling about 900 metres in both of those areas. The system will also bring some strong westerly winds and it has prompted several warnings, including one for strong winds in the Illawarra of New South Wales and also the south coast of Victoria, where wind gusts are expected to reach 90 kilometres per hour. Those conditions will ease in the coming days. Looking to the capital city's windy conditions forecast for Brisbane and Sydney, cloudy and wet conditions further south, wet conditions for Adelaide, cloudy conditions for Perth and a cloudy day for Darwin with a top of 34. Here are the top stories on ABC News. Young adults have been identified as the peak spreaders of COVID-19 and modelling by the Doherty Institute shows they should become the priority in the vaccine rollout. The modelling has been developed as part of the federal government's four-phase pathway out of the pandemic. The Institute says a reorientation is needed to focus on younger people after concentrating on the vulnerable at the beginning of the pandemic. An investigation is underway into whether a COVID-19 case detected in far north Queensland is an infection risk. The person lives in the Cairns region, but it's not yet known which strain they have or how they got it. 16 local cases have been recorded in Brisbane. All are linked to an existing cluster. New South Wales has recorded 199 new local cases and the state government has set a target of 6 million vaccine doses by the end of the month. About 3.9 million doses have been administered so far. 250 people in the state are in hospital, 53 are in intensive care, with 20 of those on ventilators. And Australian sailors Matt Belcher and Will Ryan are on the cusp of gold in the 470 class at the Tokyo Olympics. The pair finished their final heat 20 points ahead of the fleet, meaning that barring disqualification or penalty during tomorrow's medal race, they will win gold. It would be the 15th gold of the Games, just too short of Australia's best gold medal haul at an Olympics. New vaccine modelling suggests young adults are peak spreaders of COVID-19 and should become the priority in the rollout. The federal government has released the Doherty Institute's modelling developed as part of National Cabinet's four-phase pathway out of the pandemic. Professor Jody McVernon from the Doherty Institute says the approach so far has been appropriate, but now it's time to look beyond the initial stages of immunisation. We, with all other populations and considering the ethics and all other things, started by directly protecting those at most risk of severe outcomes. And the gradient um, of severity varies so substantially by age and the risks of death vary by age. All developed populations have focused on risk reduction first. Where we are now, off the base of what has been achieved with the program, um, looking at the best strategic use in moving forward, uh, our recommendation is to pursue a strategy that draws on the direct protection that's already been achieved, but amplifies it. 
by focusing now on transmission. Of course the virus will never be eliminated. It can take a very, very long time for any infectious disease that is present in any population around the world, as I'm sure Professor Kelly will tell you, and indeed Professor McVernon, to eliminate viruses around the world. But you can get to a point where you live with them. The modelling very clearly shows, once we get to a, a certain point in the vaccination strategy, which is in the next few months, we'll be able to look, look at, at that point and say that we can, can see a soft landing uh, from this in a way that no other country has seen to date. Uh, and that's the, the great hope that we see in this modelling. It will be tough to get there, and after we get there, the vaccination will also uh, continue to, to rise, but we'll need to have those other public health and other measures in place as well. The opposition wants the government to offer a one-off payment of $300 to encourage people to get vaccinated. Shadow Health Minister Mark Butler says the cash payments would help reach the 80% target outlined in the report. Labor intends to take a constructive approach to the development of this plan. This will be one of the most important decisions taken in Australia this year. Australians are desperate to see a pathway out of the constant lockdowns that are plaguing Australians. We'll take a constructive approach to it uh, and uh, we look forward to considering the modelling that's been released over the course of this afternoon. Uh, can I contrast that constructive approach, though, with the decision of the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to reject out of hand our idea, Labor's idea, for a, pay payment, a vaccine payment plan that would see incentives in place to maximise the level of vaccination in Australia. Uh, we're concerned that, that this is just another complacency on the part of the Prime Minister in, in the face of some very serious challenges to get up to the 70 or 80 per cent vaccination rates that the Doherty Institute modelling says is important for the future. Now, Scott Morrison took exactly the same approach to our idea last year for a wage subsidy as Centrelink queues started to lengthen around corners last year. He originally said that our wage subsidy idea was a dangerous idea. But he came around on that one and we ended up with a bipartisan JobKeeper support plan that served the country very well. And I hope that he does that with our vaccine payment plan as well. But Labor is concerned that he's going to take a complacent approach to vaccine rollout as he did with a complacent approach to vaccine supply. Last week we heard revelations that the government last year had de developed a deliberate wait and see strategy on vaccine supply deals with companies like Pfizer. And as a result of that complacency, countries like the UK and Japan, the US, uh, co European countries and Canada secured Pfizer deals as early as June and July last year, while the Prime Minister didn't secure one until Christmas Eve. It appears he's intent to take that same wait and see approach about whether and when we'll achieve 70 and 80 per cent vaccination rates. Well, we know from overseas experience how hard it is to get that extra 10 or 20 per cent of the population vaccinated, which is precisely why President Biden of the United States is adopting exactly the same strategy that Labor proposed today. Sydney families who are struggling in lockdown have been dealt another blow hit with childcare bills from Centrelink of up to $11,000 because they've received more in subsidies than they are entitled to. Georgie Dent is Executive Director of Advocacy Group The Parenthood. A few months ago she received a Centrelink bill of $7,000 and she joins me now. Georgie Dent, thanks so much for your time. Tell me what happened in your case. Good evening. Well, what happens is, and there are lots and lots of families right around Australia who have received similar letters, and that is that at the end of the financial year, um, Centrelink reconciles how much subsidy was paid to a particular family uh, against their income. Now, when we talk about families being paid this subsidy, it's not money that a family ever has in their own bank account. It is money that is paid from the Centrelink or um, Services Australia directly to the early learning service where your child attends. Um, 
the calculation for the subsidy is very complicated. It's not uncommon for families to not know exactly how much subsidy they will be entitled to in a given year because it changes according to lots of factors. And so what happens is often, so the, the bill that we got was actually for two years ago. Um, and that's what's happening at the moment. And the timing is extraordinarily bad, particularly for families in Sydney who are living through this extended lockdown. They're receiving these bills. So, you know, the family that got the bill of $11,000 it's for two financial years. And it's not because they didn't do their tax returns. Their tax returns were done. It's a glitch in the system that it takes um, Centrelink that long to go back through and calculate what's owing. Now, the complicating factor is that often these letters have got incorrect information. So the letter that we received um, contained figures that were not actually true. So what it said our reportable income was, was actually not correlated with our lodged tax returns. Now it took three hours on hold um, to Centrelink for me to resolve that. And we did still owe money. It wasn't as much as we had been told, but we still did owe money, but it took three hours to work through that. And it is incredibly stressful to do that. And I'm grateful that we did that when we weren't in lockdown. Um, but for lots of families right now, it is incredibly stressful because it's unexpected. And these families have been told they've got three or four weeks to, to pay the money back. So we at the Parenthood are seeking a moratorium on notices for the duration of the lockdown. And we also think that it's appropriate that there is a review to ensure that families are not receiving these letters when it's not money that's actually owed and also that they don't have to face this sort of burden at a point in time where they simply cannot sustain it. Given that you said that some people are receiving these bills from, say, two years ago, how do you think this has come around? You said it's a glitch in the system, but is Centrelink going back and looking over these bills and recalculating what people should have received and what they what they did receive? Yes, so look, it's not uncommon for these things to sort of come out a year later. Um, and, and so I, my understanding is that timing itself isn't that unusual. But I think what, what my understanding is that because of COVID last year, and particularly around the time when COVID was really bad, my understanding is that there was a sort of informal moratorium on those notices and, and that sort of process of reconciling families' income with their subsidy wasn't happening. And that's why it seems like for a lot of families, they are having now the sort of double horror of having not just one, um, you know, finding out that they owe some money just for one financial year, but actually two. And so, you know, there's lots of families where even if it's only $2,000 that they're owing, if you're owing $2,000 for two financial years and you're being asked to find $4,000, when you consider that families in Australia already pay some of the highest out-of-pocket costs for early education and care, when you consider what families in Sydney, um, but in other places as well, where there are lockdowns, where businesses have been affected, where, where shifts have been lost, it's really difficult to, you know, there, there aren't going to be very many families who have got $4,000 just sitting there ready to, to pay for, for something that they weren't expecting. And also had no way of knowing that they should be expecting this because the system is so complicated. Um, it's not a case, I think I have seen some comments around these news stories that, you know, how dare families have taken money that they weren't entitled to. It's the family is removed from this. It's money that is paid directly from the government to the services. Um, and then so it really is completely out of the blue when you get these letters saying, you know, you owe $6,000 or $5,000. Yeah, what are parents telling you about how stressful that is? Because they're given about eight weeks to pay these bills. Are they having any luck? You were able to get through to Centrelink, but like you said, it took three hours to resolve the situation. Are they having any luck with maybe extending the period of time or having their situation reviewed? I certainly know that there are families who have been able to have their situation reviewed. Um, and I think it's actually worthwhile noting that this is a scenario that's not limited to or exclusive to COVID. Um, this is something that families have been dealing with for a long time. Um, and it is in every instance incredibly stressful because these are notices that you don't know you're expecting. Um, it is, <clears throat> you might be told you've got eight weeks to pay for it, but then you also do often have to make the phone call to assess and get the full picture. And that to me was what was most stressful was that, you know, we, 
we have got three children, even when we're not trying to homeschool three children, you know, I don't necessarily have three hours spare in any given day. And yet I knew that to get to the bottom of that issue, I needed to devote my time to it. Um, and at the moment, that's just not time that families have um, available. And so I haven't heard yet from any families who have had a really quick resolution. I know that lots of families have been able to get onto Centrelink and have requested a review, um, but that means they're still in that limbo of not quite knowing where, where it's going to land. Um, but certainly in my situation, I got transferred to about four different people before someone, they all noticed and said, oh, that, yeah, we haven't used your correct income. Um, and it's, you know, how, how could something as basic as that be wrong? And then you feel that sort of uncertainty of thinking, well, I'm at the whim of a system here that I don't really understand. And it's very complex. Um, I think most people would agree that dealing with, with Centrelink on any issue, it's very rarely straightforward. It's not a sort of make the quick phone call, get it resolved and move on. It's much more complicated than that. Yeah, I think the Department of Human Services is saying to contact Services Australia to talk about your situation. Georgie Dent, really good to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much. It's no secret Australians like to drink too much, according to experts who fear it's become worse during the pandemic. But while some in lockdown have turned to binge drinking to ease COVID anxiety, a growing number are embracing a sober lifestyle. Daybreak over Moreton Bay. These early birds arrive just in time to catch the view. But for one, the outlook hasn't always been so clear. And it has been a long, hard, tough struggle. Lisa Wilkins spent 25 years in the depths of alcohol addiction until one day it became too much. I ended up in an ambulance after drinking probably two bottles of wine, two bottles of Prosecco and a litre of gin. And... Um, was found on the bathroom floor and rushed to hospital. A confronting chat with doctors started her long road to recovery. I was like, wow, OK, I have a problem. If I don't stop drinking, I'll probably die. Lisa is one of a growing number of Australians who's used the pandemic to turn the tide on her addiction. It forced me to, to sit with my feelings and to get better. The closure of pubs has also been a plus. She's also discovered a non-drinking support network. The group's numbers have more than doubled across Australia during the pandemic. Because they actually weren't able to socialise, that then gave them space to actually decide that this was something they didn't really want to do anymore. Online meetings for Alcoholics Anonymous have also doubled worldwide. So when we were at home from day to day, we monitored more how much we ate and how much we drank. One in five Australians now don't drink any alcohol, but while there's a surge in sobriety, online alcohol sales have exploded. Support groups are now calling for further funding and for tougher controls on door-to-door -door deliveries. Now nearly two years sober, Lisa says she's proud of the woman she's become. I'm not ashamed of that life. It's a past life now, though, and I'm a completely different person. But thank God I'm not that person anymore. A new dawn for a new woman. Phoebe Hosier, ABC News. Hundreds of Australians stranded in Bali are still looking for ways to...